thank you. Uh, I know you've probably got three questions. Firstly, who am I? Secondly, what's MicroWatt? And thirdly, what's IBM doing at this conference? So hopefully I'll answer all those questions and more in this presentation. So let's get started. Uh, I'm new to the open hardware world, but I've been working with Linux and open source all my career. I think I'm 100 in Linux years. Uh, this is like the early 2000s where we were working in, in Australia on a, a startup around Linux. Uh, I've spent a lot of my time at IBM and I've been doing 100% Linux and open source work as well. Uh, we really believe open source is a better way to build software. Um, it's become a big business for us and of course with the, uh, the acquisition of Red Hat, it's our biggest acquisition. So as a business, as a company, we believe in open source. Who's heard of Power? So hopefully some people have, good, good. PowerPC, yes. IBM, maybe, yes, okay. Um, Power is our architecture. It's been around for a long time. Uh, it's risk-based. Uh, it's a part of all of our servers that we build. Um, a few examples of what we built last year, Summit and Sierra, uh, number one and two on the top 500. Uh, so we do high performance computing, business computers, servers, stuff like that. Uh, open power, uh, now that was uh, an effort a number of years ago and it was around opening up the architecture. Um, but the focus here was more around the system level, system design, circuit boards, uh, interfaces and all that kind of stuff. And that was kind of the first step in the journey of moving from open sourcing our software, but also then moving into the hardware realm. Uh, an example of what we've done on the software side is our firmware stack now is completely open source. So from power on right through to booting a Linux operating system, you can pick it up on GitHub. Uh, and that same software stack is the same software firm, the same firmware stack that runs on, for example, Summit and Sierra. So our, uh, you know, we really believe in open source as a, a better way to build products. Uh, one of our partners it builds a nice development environment. So it's a Power9 based box that uses the same open source components. Uh, and they're very big on vendor, uh, sorry, uh, user controlled hardware. So basically everything that runs there, even down to the, uh, the, the, the PLDs, the CPLDs and stuff like that, you can get to the source to. Uh, the next step, and this is what was announced in August, uh, and the next logical step and something we've been hoping to see for a while was basically opening up the instruction set architecture as well. So we've been through a progression of open sourcing all our software, open sourcing our system designs. The next logical step, obviously, was to open source the instruction set. Uh, so it's licensed now to the Open Power Foundation, which is part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, and as well as that, we offer a royalty-free uh, license, including a patent grant, so that you can implement your own chip. So the next step, what are we going to do? And so as I said, I'm uh, uh, a software person. I'm not a very good hardware person. Uh, I don't think I'm holding that soldering on quite right. Uh, the other thing I'll note is uh, my wife keeps telling me I've got to spend more time, or I've got to find more time to have a holiday. And I think my view of a tropical holiday in hers is probably not uh, exactly the same. Oh, gosh. I don't pass anything here, do I? I, I work, yeah, the eyes are, are, are sorted, but uh, I'll go back and work on that. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so what's MicroWatt? MicroWatt was a simple effort within IBM uh, with, uh, from our software group, uh, some of our software people. Uh, it was predominantly me. It was an idea a couple of months before we announced in August that we just needed something interesting to show. So uh, we were working towards opening the instruction set architecture. That's all well and good. What do you bring at that announce? And so that was basically a very small power core. Uh, it uses what we call the, the fixed point uh, scalar subset. So it's, it's simple. It's maybe 100 and something instructions, uh, not that hard to implement. It's written in VHDL 2008, uh, and uh, I, I hid in the corner, but uh, you're completely right that IBM does a lot of Verilog, it does a lot of VHDL as well, and the reason why I chose VHDL was I was quite interested to use it as a bit of a pipe cleaner to see what the open source tools were like, uh, see how good the support is, uh, and um, that was really one of the reasons why we picked it. Obviously we're using GHDL, uh, and it's available on GitHub. Very simple, it's not going to set the world on fire, a couple of stages of execute, so, sorry, fetch, decode, execute, right back. Uh, as I said, it meant to be simple, easy to understand and show just how simple a power, uh, a compliant power core could be. The other important thing is we used a bunch of components from the open hardware world. We do it all the time in the software world, but um, you know, it, obviously we wanted to do the same in the hardware world. We concentrated on the core and everything around it was just, um, we'd pull in components where we could. So we put it out uh, late August and threw it up on GitHub and waited and waited for the first commit. And what do you think the first commit would be? I think I'll... <laughs> Correct. 
it was Olaf, and it basically was a couple of hours, I think, and already he'd sent us a commit and said, you know, here's Fusoc, Fusoc support. And it was interesting because um, I didn't know about this project actually, and it saved us a whole bunch of trouble with obviously the vendor tools, you know, some of the, the, the proprietary tools that are quite painful to deal with, proprietary FPGA tools, and so that was fantastic. Um, and that was literally, I think, I think you seem to be a couple of hours, we, we put anything open source out in the hardware world and, and a few socks of support appears in about two or three hours. It's crazy. Uh, in the last month, so we've been out for a month, what's happened? A lot of stuff's happened. We've got DRAM support, thanks to Ben back home and Florent, who I think is here somewhere. Yep, fantastic. Um, that's been really good, right? And again, we've reused a bunch of stuff. We didn't have to implement anything ourselves. Um, and that was, that was brilliant. Uh, I think Tristan might be here too. Yes, fantastic. Um, a lot of support from the GHDL side. We're really keen to start seeing some of this synthesis stuff that you're working on. Um, and when we can get that natively through to the open source tools, I think that's going to be uh, brilliant. Uh, we have done a, a translation across to Verilog. Um, Mikey back home has been doing it, and we're quite keen to get on top of the Yostis and the next PNR, place and route tools, and all that kind of stuff. I think that's going to be very interesting for us. Um, a few other contributions around the place. We've got a, a hardware divider um, and pipelining, and uh, Tim's also been helping us along the way with just his knowledge of FPGAs, so that's been great. Uh, just quickly, some of the things we think we got right. We started very simple. Um, we basically used, we basically built it from the instruction up. So we basically verified each instruction, uh, and then once we knew everything was solid, it wasn't much effort to bring the CPU up. We started with something interesting, MicroPython, uh, which is something small, but also quite interesting to play with and quite useful. Uh, and we also hope to make it easy to use. Basically, you you git pull, you type make, and away you go. A strong focus on testing, there's a make check uh, so that everyone who's, te who's playing with it can quickly work out if they've uh, broken the core or not. There's a bit of a CI on GitHub uh, and so the flow all works through GitHub. Uh, and it's a combination of tests including random workloads and random execution testing. Well, another thing that was interesting, we had the advantage, we had a highly capable Power9 core so we used that as our gold standard, standard for verification which is really quite useful because we had an endless supply of random data that we could match up against. So it was very quick for us to use that to, um, to verify and, and uh, build upon uh, what uh, Power9 provides. We also got to leverage the 64-bit software stack. So all our distros that exist, Red Hat, SUSE, RHEL, Fedora, uh, it's already there. And one of the conscious decisions was to make sure we were compatible with that. We didn't want to have to do any cross builds or anything like that. We wanted to be native uh, and that allowed us to do it. Uh, and then it was stable, then we can add all the stuff like pipelining and, and things like that. The other thing was we wanted to focus on the core uh, and just use open source components around it. And that's what we did and that's been fantastic. What we got wrong, uh, we decided, we ran out of time, we didn't put a hardware divider in, we took too long to put it in. That was an area of incompatibility, it caused us a bunch of problems. Uh, we should have got there earlier. Uh, to start with, we didn't simulate fr from end to end. We, cut a few corners and, and again it was a two month part time project we thought it's good enough let's throw it out the door uh, that was a mistake we've gone and, and added say a behavioral UART and we're now simulating end to end which is much more um, effective and we didn't think about error and frequency on the FPJ to start with uh, we're fixing some of those sins now again it was a conscious effort really to get out the door as soon as possible and then work on the problems uh, Another thing, uh, the vendor tools are, are painful just to do a lot of this stuff. Yosis has been really good, so it's much easier for us to play with things, look at costs, look at performance, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that's been really good and we want to use that some more. Some of the bugs have been epic. That's the double, the double character print, which it was completely functional. It just would print two characters. We quite liked. Uh, next question is why we're doing this. And there's a number of reasons why IBM open the architecture and, and all that kind of stuff. I thought I'd just mention some of the reasons why I think it's important and maybe that might resonate with the community here. The first thing is, is I think diversity is good. And I've worked on Linux all the time, but I look across at the BSDs and I feel like they're doing a lot of good stuff, uh, especially in the last couple of years around security. Uh, and and OpenBSD has really been ahead of the game on things like Spectre and Meltdown. So I think diversity in software is good. Diversity in hardware is good as well. And diversity in open hardware. Also, from our perspective, we could leverage the software stack. Uh, we have a very uh, complete and capable software stack that already runs a number of distros. And from that perspective, you know, it just allowed us to leverage what we already do. We have LLVM and GCC compiler teams, all that kind of stuff. So um, we can leverage all the efforts we do already on top of power. 
Thirdly, it's fun. And it's been a blast. I've had a lot of fun. As I said, I've come from the software side. It's been a lot of fun to play with hardware. Uh, I think we're seeing, at this point in time, a lot of software people coming through because the tooling is getting better, the FPGAs are getting cheaper, they're more capable, you can do a lot more with them. And so I think over time we'll see more software people coming into the hardware community, which I think is good. Uh, I thought I'd mention some tooling issues we've had. Um, I mean, one thing, you know, obviously we know VHDL is not um, the most popular language in the open hardware community. And one problem we have is not, a, not having a valid way of doing VHDL and Verilog COSIM. And that tends to be a bit of a problem, especially as we're pulling in components around us outside the core that are Verilog based. A VHDL synthesis so we can use open tools. But um, Tristan, that's being worked on, which is fantastic. Uh, and so eventually we'd like to have a completely open source flow end to uh, end. -to -end. Uh, and then finally, um, and this, this goes away a bit if we have synthesis, but the tooling to do VHDL or Verilog uh, conversion, or the open tooling, there's some good proprietary tools out there, but the open tools uh, are not very good and they don't support a lot of VHDL 2008 constructs. So, you know, that's, that's a bit of a gap as well. Next steps, we're going to get our area under control. We'd like to get on top of Yosis. Uh, we're going to add supervisor state, get Linux booting. Um, we're Linux kernel people, so we kind of have an idea of what we need to add. We just need to go off and do it. Uh, and then what we'd love to see is an implementation in another language. Uh, I come from the software side, so I look at VHDL and Verilog and think, uh, yeah, exactly, and I, and I look at the other languages and, and, and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on around, uh, around next new, new hardware languages, so I think we'd like to jump on something and have a bit of a play. Uh, and that's it, and that's, my desk is, is fast uh, filling up with FPGA dev boards, I'm sure everyone else has similar problems. Um, Without any questions. Hi. Um, so, how was it for a software engineer to come to writing parallel hardware? What was it like? Well, so I, I'm a little bit lucky. So, I, I, I have worked with a lot of hardware people over time. So, I think maybe got a little bit through osmosis. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, the hardware people when they when they said when they heard I'd written something, firstly they thought I'd written a one-cycle pipeline. It's like no, no, no. I at least kind of know what's going on here. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it 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 wasn't that hard. There's a lot of good stuff online, a lot of good stuff to 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 look at, um, a lot of good examples. So there's a lot of lot of nice simple cores out there now, um, whether it be you know um, uh, Risk Five or some of the older. Um, cores out there and so there's a lot of stuff to look at um, and it, so once you get started it's not that not that hard I think so yeah you mentioned that you're currently using uh, Yosis for some testing yeah but uh, GHDL is not completely working yet so how are you using Yosis that is via the verific from them or some other we so we we, we have a, 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 a pr pr proprietary converter so we can do that um, and get it into Verilog and then pass it through the flow um, I mean, we have been playing with, with the early work and, and some stuff is synthesizing, but we're not there yet. But for the, for the analysis we've done there, it was basically using uh, a vendor tool to get us from VHDL to Verilog. Sorry to grab you again, but... Um, yep. Two things. Yes. Um, my personal project is actually written in VHDL, has been since 2009, and I'd like to say thank you so much, Tristan. You give me GHDL, awesome, I can do stuff anywhere, including the pub. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I think, and again, uh, I think the El Cheapo model sim simulator can actually do VHDL and Verilog. But okay. there's a what's, size what's El Cheapo mean? Is well, it, as in, it's off it's, the web. It's oh, free. okay. There's, yeah. So there's a free. That's quite interesting. I didn't know about that, so it might be worth a look. I, I do know someone was looking at plugging in maybe NVC with one of the, I don't know if it was Verilog or Icarus Verilog, um, Verilator or Icarus Verilog. But there's a, there's a gap there that I think we'd, you know, we'd love to see closed um, at some point. Yeah. So you mentioned specifically 2008. Is there <laughs> anything you use beyond the all keyword of 2008? <laughs> uh, there's a few things. It's funny. Uh, we, we tried to be really, really boring with what we supported, but then it, as every time we added a new vendor tool, something, you know, uh, 
2008, you think by now that they'd have reasonable support, but yeah, exactly. Disastrous, right? Coming from the software world, we're not fantastic there, but at least you'd think by this stage, you know, C++, whatever, you'd be supporting it, but no. And so it's getting worse and worse over the time, so uh, we're, we're supporting even less and less, and maybe it might just be the all word by the, by the time we're finished, who knows? Um, but yeah, definite, definite problem. So, question about uh, Open Power is uh, not a new initiative, right? So, it's no. 2013 and it was the beginning of it, and uh, it seems like it's getting more open recently. Yep. Um, uh, it's like it's opening Open Power, and how, what is the next step of opening more uh, of Open Power? <laughs> because, you know, all these licensing questions and uh, copy and all related infrastructure questions. Uh, is how open is actually. Yep. Yep. And, and yeah, I mean, we've, we had been pushing internally to release the ISA because it was the next step and uh, it was a gap. So now that we've opened it, that bit, I'm not sure what else. I mean, our BMCs are all open source now, so uh, we use OpenBMC, so the entire stack there is open. So I think we're running out of things to open. Maybe I'm out of a job. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you said that the the patents are also licensed, so I can build a replica yep. of IBM's chip as long as it's open source. Yep. I can make a physical implementation yep. using all of IBM's patents and not so, get sued. So, uh, I didn't bring my attorney with me. Um, there's, there's specifics around it, yes, but, but you, can build, you can build a compatible implementation of power, and if it's compatible, you get the patent grant with it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. If, if it's required to implement it, you'll get it. Thank you. Very much. Cool. Thank you.